I'm Graham Glynn, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University, and this is Innovations and in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices to teaching and applications of educational technology that have a positive effect on student learning. On our show, I'm joined by Troy Wilskill and David Hansen, and we'll be discussing process-oriented, guided, inquiry-based learning. Welcome to the, to the show, Dave and Troy. Hi, Graham. Great. Thanks, So, Dave, Graham. what is inquiry-based learning? Well, inquiry-based learning, uh, we give students uh, a model or something to explore and that model contains everything we'd like them to learn and then we guide them in that exploration process so they process the information and develop concepts. And you say you give them a model, what does that mean? Well, a model is any representation of what we want them to learn. So it could be a table of data, could okay. be a diagram, could be um, even an equation that we want them to figure out what the equation means and how they can use it. Okay. Um, and how does this differ from a traditional lecture approach to, uh, to, to chemistry? Well, on a traditional lecture approach, which I, which I originally used when I came to Stony Brook, um, one basically tells the students all these things. You say, here's the equation, here's what, it's, here's, here's what it means, here's you, how you use it, now go home and solve some problems with it. Okay. So in this case, you literally give them a set of data, do you give them instructions, you're supposed to accomplish something with this Yeah, set well, that's, of data? The, that's the guided inquiry piece. So, okay. so um, an inquiry approach, the pure inquiry approach is sort of like research. You have a question, you've got to figure out what to do to answer it and invent new knowledge. Right. In guided inquiry, you might be given the data or given something to do, and then you're asked questions, and the questions guide your exploration of that model and that activity. I see. So how do the students react to this type of approach? Well, now they react pretty positively about it, and they liked it. When we first started this in 1994, we got pretty hostile comments from students because they weren't used to it. They'd go back to the residence halls and they'd say, well, gee, they didn't do that last year when I took the course. Right. And uh, we got comments on the course evaluations along the lines of, I don't know why you're making me do all this work. You're being paid to teach me. Okay. That's always one of the barriers to innovation. Uh, the students have this amazing network where they, they talk to the students who took the class before and if it doesn't meet the expectations, of the course, they, they tend to complain, irrespective of whether it's good, bad, bad or indifferent, uh, they take a totally different approach. So the process-based part of this, that's, uh, I presume you're responsible for the process, you're giving the students the process. Well, the process, yeah, the, the, the process idea originates in, uh, well, actually originates with Dan Apple, who uh, has a company called Pacific Crest, and he came to Stony Brook uh, a long time ago and presented some workshops on his software programs that he was using. And he pointed out to faculty that the content in your course is not what's important because the content gets obsolete. Mm -hmm. What's really important are the learning process skills that you're trying to teach them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I picked up on what he was saying and I, we identified uh, some skill areas that were important for learning in chemistry and science and incorporated those into our activities and the idea is that process skills, like information processing, critical analytical thinking, um, problem solving, then oral and written communication, teamwork even, and then one that we call metacognition, are at least as important as content. So if you are, many faculty talk about, if you ask a faculty member what they want to teach their students, they quite often say, oh, I want to teach critical thinking. I want them to, to understand how to interpret data and, and all the, what you've just been talking about. But many of us fall short in that attempt. But if that's what you're teaching, how do you assess whether you've achieved that? The, um, well, <coughs> that generally is a very difficult problem, uh, especially when we have large course, large classes like we have at Stony Brook, and we're pretty much forced to use multiple choice exams. Mm -hmm. And so we've identified different levels of questions that we ask students. So we have questions at the information level, uh, the conceptual understanding level, the algorithmic application, and problem solving level. And so we can see how students perform at these different levels. And in order to answer what we call conceptual questions, they actually have to have some understanding 
And to solve problems, they have to be able to do analysis and synthesis and put ideas together. And we see distinct differences in levels of performance from students on these different levels of questions. Okay. Um, Can Mark? I just add Absolutely. something to that? Uh, the other thing that we do in the guided inquiry classroom is students are engaged with each other, discussing things, trying to come to an understanding uh, through this guided inquiry activity. And as they do that, they are faced with uh, demonstrating all s or, and using all sorts of skills uh, that don't often end up in, on exams. And we use those as the criteria for grading these classrooms. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, when I took over the workshops, one of the things that the teaching assistants complained about was students wouldn't focus on the activity. Mm -hmm. Very simple skill, focus. Uh, so what we did was we said, well, in order to give yourselves a perfect score for the workshop, your whole team must be focused on the activity. 